Hi everyone, welcome back to Agile Question Practice Time, ideal for preparing for your PMP or your project management professional, for your certified associate in project management, for your Agile certified practitioner, any of the above or more certifications, really, really useful, or even just for checking the knowledge within your team. We've got 10 questions today, it's going to be absolutely fantastic, let's get into it. Your Agile team has been working with feature-driven development as a model for their Agile way of work for some time now, and are ready to add more feature-driven development practice practices to the things that they do. What can we do next as a team? Uh, ask the product owner for more features in the backlog. Uh, you know, that could be a standard sort of uh, agile thing. The product owner definitely owns the backlog or prioritizes the features that come up. They represent the customer. That's what we want. That, that's okay. Hold a retrospective to gather ways to improve. Um, I mean, yes, that's also good. Retrospective is also quite good. Um, we want to gather ways to improve. That's a maybe as well. Uh, incorporate configuration management and individual class ownership. That sounds a bit more complex, uh, but that's a maybe as well because these are things that as you delve more into feature-driven development, they're actually a part of feature-driven development. So let's put that as a maybe as well and see key, uh, send key representatives to the scrum of scrums across the organization. Uh, look, I mean, that's also good. So all of these are agile practices. So this is really important. But the, the one that is most concerned with feature-driven development is uh, incorporating configuration management and individual class ownership. And what these are is, uh, is change management practices. So what happens when you change the overall model? And with feature-driven development, you're uh, looking at a high-level model of what, what we're delivering. And then we're breaking that down into features that will get us to that, uh, to that model. And then we're breaking those features down into stories. And, uh, and then once we have those stories, we, when they're delivered into a feature, we see if they've worked and we iterate or we change if necessary. So that's the change management method. And that could be different depending on your team as long as the team has agreed on how we do it. Uh, and individual class ownership, it means that maybe a person or a group of people will own a particular class um, within the code and that way they're responsible for that and they, they, can, uh, yeah, they know everything about it. They become experts in that domain. So all of that to say, let's go with answer C for now. And there it is. More feature-driven development core engineering practices. All right, so these are core engineering practices. We're delving into the more technical side now, which is really cool. Even though it doesn't have to be technical, you know, this is where we're, we're going. And a big part of Agile it can be technical as well. Configuration management, ensuring that changes are known and tracked. And individual class ownership, where parts of the code are assigned to a single owner and they become the experts and the owners and responsible for that, for that part of the code. And domain object mod modeling as, as well. So this is a conceptual model of the domain showing both behavior and data. And you know that's another part uh, that we can look into. You might use a context diagram, for example, where you've got the system and you know, the information's flowing to and from other systems. Uh, and you know, so that's one way to do it. Uh, there are, or a, a, a sequence diagram you might use, many different methods. Uh, wow, that was a really good question to kick us off. Let's get into the next one. An executive in your organization approaches you about working in an agile team. They've heard about feature-driven development and would like to try it as a test and learn in your team. What do they mean by this? So what do they mean by test and learn or feature-driven development? Let's have a look. Uh, your team will rely on previous feature designs for your work. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Your team features certain uh, abilities and showcases them to other teams. I don't think that one either. You know, it certainly has the words in it, but it's not necessarily about agile or feature-driven development. Your team enjoys the feature of working with agile and an agile organization. Not necessarily as well. Um, again, it has the word in it, but probably not necessarily for feature-driven development. And last, your team will trial developing an overall model, here we go, then planning, designing, and building by those features, which is exactly feature-driven dri development. And so we, we have the overall view, the overall model of what we're trying to do or accomplish or create. And then we have features that uh, you know, we design by those features. And then we create you know, individual story cards to uh, exactly as we saw before. And then when we release something, we get feedback on it and then we, we iterate. So we change if necessary. And that's the benefit behind developing by feature and having feature teams you know, who, who are experts in those particular features or those domains as well. Uh, let's go with answer D. Answer D. 
Agile feature-driven development starts with an overall model, then plans, designs, and builds by those features. Once a feature is complete, the process can begin again, complete with any learning from the previous feature. So we've released it, customers have given us a little bit of feedback, and now we, can, we might need to adjust our approach. And that's the benefit of feature-driven development. That was another good one. All right, let's keep, keep going. For Kanban, okay, moving on, or flow-based Agile, iterations follow the number of story cards in the work in progress limit, or WIP we call it sometimes, shown on the visual or virtual board, which is our Kanban board. Uh, so it's a columns where we move uh, the features or stories or tasks across the board from, uh, from the backlog all the way to done. And that's just a good way to, to keep track of everything. Uh, so the team pulls cards from the backlog column on the Kanban board based on their capacity. So if someone has extra capacity, they can pull maybe extra cards, start working on those. These story cards provide an increment of value. Yes, exactly. And they are a primary driver of executive behavior, primary measure of progress. Yes, I like that. Primary way to pay for the cost of an agile team. Uh, not necessarily. Primary enablement, enabler of people's engagement. Uh, I mean, look, that's a tricky one because progress actually has been shown, like there have been studies done, that when people are making a, a, a have a sense of progress, that is when they feel the most engaged. Uh, so it actually could be that one. <laughs> but Kanban by itself as a method um, is a way, a primary way of showing the progress, is actually showing and measuring that progress. So let's go with answer B for now. Answer B. The key to Kanban is making progress visible. Progress naturally improves team engagement. Oh, there you go. No one likes being stuck and blockers are clear for people to see so we can see it on the board. Oh, it's been on the board for two weeks. Okay, maybe we need to do something about that. Swarm around the problem, see if we can fix it. Uh, and we can also assist with those problems. That was another good question. Wow, these are really good today. Uh, so we've got uh, Kanban. Let's move on to the next one and see how we go. You have just come on board an Agile team and a decision needs to be made about product requirements. Oh, this is good. The Scrum Master asks the team to show either thumbs up, thumbs down, or sideways. Okay, what does a thumb sideways mean? That the team member doesn't mind about the decision either way? Uh, I mean, that sounds right, but that's not right, and we'll see why in a second. The power behind Agile is interactions, remember. It's discussion and getting answers quickly, not waiting. Uh, so this is why this is really important. The team member has a concern or conflict that needs further discussion. And this is the most powerful part behind this actual, this method that we're using here. Very simple method, deceptively simple, but also extremely powerful. The team member defers to the executive sponsor to decide. That will happen a lot, um, even just by default, just because executives sometimes have the loudest voice in the room or even the most power in the room. And again, that's why having discussion and having open discussion is so important because someone might have information about this that the executive does not know about. The decision is outside the team member's expertise and they choose not to vote. Um, unfortunately, in an agile team, everyone has to vote. And you know, I mean, we're not gonna force anyone, but we want everyone to have a voice for that very reason, that there is information that people might have or know, or even questions they might ask that might bring up you know, something that we need to think about or talk about. But for this one, we're going to go with answer B. And there it is. You, when voting in an Agile team, members who vote with a thumb sideways have a concern or conflict with the decision and would like to discuss it further. Uh, and it's the same with the fist of five. So, you know, uh, if you've got people will you know, vote on something uh, and say, how confident are they in this? And if they give a three or below, uh, then basically that gives them the chance to discuss that item or discuss their concerns. Really important. All right, we're getting through it. Next question. You're at the beginning of a new iteration and about to plan and decide what gets worked on in the upcoming sprint. Oh, these are great questions today. You decide to invite all project stakeholders to the planning meeting to decide what to work on next. Why is it important that all stakeholders are involved in decision making? And oh, now this is a great one. Um, currently, you know, I mean, you will face this in your job where people don't want everyone to be involved in decision making. Um, you know, th these are the remnants of the old ways of doing projects. But you know what? Then you're missing out on all of the good stuff. But let's see why it's important as well. So you can keep on an eye on what they're doing. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is great. Uh, so we invite those stakeholders to keep an eye on them just in case who knows what sneaky things they might be doing. Uh, look, I mean, that, I mean, that might be a thing, but it's not the agile thing, I guess. So let's not go with that for now. So business representatives can report back to their managers on the project. Uh, I mean, that will help, um, but maybe that's not the 100% thing either. So the team feels important and with lots of stakeholders present. Uh, I mean, that, that's definitely not the one. Uh, must be the last one. So the project stakeholders don't reject a decision that wasn't theirs. Oh, and this is the power behind keeping everyone involved, uh, actually, actually involved in decisions and inviting them, keeping things open and transparent. Because then those stakeholders don't reject a decision that wasn't theirs uh, because they weren't part of it uh, if they're not part of it, then they can say, oh, look, I don't like it. And look, studies have shown again that people are more likely to reject an idea that, that they don't have any ownership in or they don't have any um, con uh, contribution to. So, uh, you know, it's just a normal psycholo psychological thing within people every day. And you will probably have found this in your job already. If you haven't, you certainly will. All of that to say, let's go with answer D for now. There it is. Giving ownership in decisions to the team and stakeholders is one way to gain their buy-in. If stakeholders are involved in decision-making, they'll be more committed to any decision made and to the project itself as well. So important. And that's, a, that's another really, really good question, guys. Uh, all right, I think we've got five to go. Let's get to it. You're doing great. You're in an agile team and you notice that it's different to other project areas that you have worked on. That's right, it will be very different. And sometimes, you know, there's a, f a fuzzy middle. We have to work through and get through all of this uh, stuff to get to the good stuff in an agile team. That transparency, um, you know, that, that fast flow of, uh, of information and of work through the team. The project manager tells you there are certain ways to ensure that stakeholders stay engaged. What is he talking about? That's a good question. Okay, removing any team member who is not engaged in the project. Oh, look, I mean, I mean, you may come across this in your career, certainly. It's not the first choice, absolutely. Certainly there are, there are times when uh, people just don't fit and you will find this, it will happen in your career, but that's not the first choice in an agile team. We want people to come along for the journey if possible. Uh, so giving any extra work to the better engaged team members. No, we want everyone to be involved as we've seen and everyone to have an opinion and to be involved in the work. Ensuring visibility, transparency, and progress of the work through charts and information in the common team area. Uh, yes, so this is a really great way to keep people involved. Uh, and as they're involved, as we've seen, they're engaged or more engaged. So all of that transparency of the information, it's right there. People can see it at the drop of a hat. They can walk through the team area and see how the team is going. And you know what? Sometimes it's not going well, but then everyone sees it and we can say, look, maybe we need to help and do something about it. Uh, so that is why that's so important. Last one, offering a possible promotion to the most engaged team member at the end of the project. Uh, look, I mean, this will happen in ebbs and flows. Some people will get promoted, some people will stay where they are. There are very different reasons you know, all across your career for, for seeing these things happen. Um, but that one is not specifically part of an agile team. So let's go with answer C. And there it is, visibility, uh, visible progress helps maintain team engagement and is facilitated through the use of the information radiator, which is that team area, the Kanban board, the burn down chart, the product backlog, seeing that and being for that being clearly visible to everyone. And that's just a great way to keep people engaged. Great stuff, guys. Last four questions, doing great. You've been identified as a stakeholder on an agile software development team. As you join the stand up, the team stand up, you're surprised that there are only eight people on the team and no more. After all, the deliverable is quite large. Oh no, if it's large, we must need heaps of people, right? Actually, not right. So let's see why. Why is the team so small? The, the agile methodology is being trialed as a cross-discipline, self-forming team. Uh, I mean, look, that will happen and that's sort of a thing. You know, we want our agile teams to be self-forming. We want them to have that domain knowledge to actually care about the product that we're developing. Uh, this one's a maybe, I'm not sure about this. So one person was selected for each role necessary and no more. Uh, not necessarily true. We might need multiple developers, for example. We might need multiple testers even, um, even multiple business analysts, uh, but probably only one product owner if we can possibly help it. Uh, not that one. Agile methods recommend the delivery team to be 12 or fewer members. 
yes to this one. So this is an actual recommendation by Agile. And the reason why this is a recommendation by Agile is the communication channels. Let me tell you why. There's an actual formula for this. I can't remember it off the top of my head. Oh, maybe I can. Um, but the more people you have, the more ways there are to communicate, the more channels there are of communication. If you have two people, it's just back and forward easy. If you have three people, now you have this way, this way, and then uh, this one, and then, uh, and then if you've got four, then it actually starts to increase uh, almost exponentially. So it's, uh, it, it's not just four methods of communication because now you know, each, people, each person will be communicating with each other person. So it's, it's more like you know, a 10, 10 ish or eight or seven or eight actual communication channels there. And then more and more and more and more and more. I think the actual uh, mathematics behind it is like, say if we've got 12, it's like 12 multiplied by 12 minus one. So 12 minus multiplied by 11. I think it's something like that. Someone please correct me. I, I, I go and check the actual mathematics behind it. Um, it's very simple to find out. But you know, as you can see, it's not just 12 channels of communication. It's something like, what, what is that? Like 130 or something similar, uh, different ways and methods by the water cooler, by email, you know, this person talking to that person. So that increases the complexity. Anyway, enough of me waffling on, but that's really important. And let's go with answer C. Agile methods recommend a team of 12 or fewer, typically between three or nine. And this keeps the communication channels small and ensures information travels quickly for the team to do their work. And that's the important part behind it. Well done, guys. Keep going, we've got a couple to go. Question, next question. Oh, and it's another good one too. This is such a good uh, session. I'm glad you came along for this one. As the lead on an Agile project, you have carefully cultivated a team of T-shaped people. And we have been through this before in our Agile questions, but what is a T-shaped person? They have a broad range of interests and, uh, and skills. So they might have a bit of development, they might have a bit of design, they might have a bit of requirements gathering, they might have a little bit of you know, testing or automation or something similar. Um, and yet, at the same time, they have one deep specialty, one extreme specialty that they're really, really very good at, and that's their core function. Um, so that T-shaped team member is such an asset. If you can get those T-shaped team members and they're happy to work with you and they're engaged and they're, they're good people, you know, this is the most valuable thing on the planet and it will help you get your work done. Uh, anyway, all of that, let's go, let's see what we've got here. Uh, a person that has flat knowledge up top and long knowledge down the bottom. Okay, not that one. A person with a wide range of general skills and one deep skill or knowledge area. Well, as we've seen, that's the one. What else have we got here just so we know what, what to look out for? A person with a right, wide range of leadership skills as everyone should lead on an agile team. Yes, we do want everyone to lead on an agile team, um, but that's not for our T-shaped people. You know, that's not the definition of it at this stage. A person that has more contacts in the management layers and few contacts in the team layer. Again, not that one. So we know that we're going for answer B, and there it is. That a generalizing specialist is a person that has one deep knowledge, area or skill, and a wide range of general interests or skills. An agile team is generally made up, or is ideally made up of these generalizing specialists who can do more than one thing, but also do their core role well. Well done guys, last two questions, you're doing great. In 2001, a group of individuals representing the most widely used lightweight software development methodologies agreed on a common set of values and principles which became known as the Agile Manifesto. This is uh, this sentence, you'll see this so often um, because this is where Agile came from. You know, all of these, the, the core individuals came coming together and agreeing on that high level manifesto that has become Agile. In that manifesto they valued, what do they value? Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Definitely that one. Executive reporting over bottom-up reporting. Scrum masters over project managers. Uh, yeah, I mean, the name doesn't matter, but the function and what we do actually matters. So doing the work, overviewing the work. Uh, that sounds nice, but that's not part of our Agile manifesto. So let's go with answer A here, nice and easy. There it is, made up of four core values, one of which is valuing individuals and interactions over process and tools. Well done, guys. I think we'll have a few more of these over our next couple of videos too. Last question, well done. You're doing amazing work. Keep going. 
here we go. You're planning the next iteration for your Agile team as the Agile lead. And the team is going to select user stories from the prioritized release backlog, elaborate those user stories, and estimate the work needed for each user story. The number of stories selected is based on. And this question is awesome. Scenario-based question. You're really going to have to do this in an Agile team. So important. What the Scrum Master says, uh, as they know best, nope. Scrum Master facilitates discussion within the team. The team's velocity, which is the rate at which a team can complete work. Yes. The number of stories. Yes, that's exactly it. So if we have 20 stories in the backlog, but we know that we can get five stories done in an iteration, then we're going to take five stories and we're going to put them and plan them for the upcoming iteration. That is our velocity of work, how fast we can do the work. Uh, and that's just based on the average of what we've completed over past iterations. Uh, Feature-driven development model, no. What the team wants to work on to ensure individuals work within their strengths. Also, not necessarily. We do want people to be engaged in what they're doing, but the product owner decides the priorities because they represent the customer, and we select how much work we can do based on our velocity. Let's go with answer B, and there it is. The team's velocity is the amount of work they complete on average in a given iteration. Now this can be measured in different ways, in points, in cards, in features, in stories, in t-shirt sizings, um, or any other method that works for the team as long as the team agrees together on that method. The number of points in a sprint, however, is based on the average velocity of points from previous iterations. And we made it, you made it, you've done amazing work, and you're preparing yourself so well, and also learning a little bit, little bit about this wonderful thing called Agile that you will see in your career over the next 50 years. It's only going to get bigger, and you're doing a great job. Keep going. I'll see you in the next couple of videos, and bye for now.